Amen. So today I want to look at something called, because God has been talking to us about word application, the rise of the remnant, stewardship, blossom season. And I continue to declare this is the blossom season. This is our blossom season. The bite can't stop the blossom. That's a word that is etched in my heart. The bite can't stop the blossom. And I thank God this is our blossom season. So today uh, I want to look at something called shift from sinking thinking. And the objective is to sink with his resurrection. Shift from sinking thinking. And I want us to sink with his resurrection. Now you got to get the spelling right. And you don't go and misquote me and say she wants us to sink with the resurrection. It doesn't make sense. It's S-Y-N-C. Short for synchronize or synchronization. Are you with me? So we're going to shift from sinking thinking. And our objective today is to get all of us in a place where we sink with his resurrection. Tell your neighbor it's time to sink with his resurrection. And say, here now, shift from that sinking thinking. Pronounce the word correctly though. Say it a little fast, but pronounce it. Say it again. Shift from that sinking thinking. <laughs> you got to help me out today. Because I myself got to be careful. And we have to sink with his resurrection. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's look at Matthew chapter 14 verses 25 to 33. And I'm going to be doing it perhaps verse by verse. So you're going to follow with me. It's something that we're all familiar with and that's fine. But God is extracting some things today. Oh, he has allowed me to extract some things that we need now in our now. Amen. Quite familiar and yet still a lot of people miss it. We, we can know something and know of it rather than actually know the essence of the thing by experience. You know what you know what you know when you know it. You know? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing. Praise God. So Matthew chapter 24 verse 25, it reads, Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them. Walking on the sea. Let me pause there for a minute. On the fourth watch of the night. So it was a dark time. Jesus went to them. We will find out of them for those of you who don't know later on. He went to them walking on the sea. Jesus will listen. Listen carefully. Jesus will always, and I mean always, hallelujah, come to you. Wherever you are, and he will usually do it Jesus style. When he comes, you might not recognize how he is doing what he's doing because uh, he will always do it Jesus style. He don't do anything like man. He came to them, it says here, and uh, he came at night. He went to them walking, walking on the sea. I was wondering, Jesus being Jesus, if he was able to walk on the water, and he did, why didn't he just appear in the boat? Have you ever considered that? That he's Jesus, you're already walking on the water. He could have appeared on the boat or just lift the boat with one hand or point at the boat and the boat can float. Anything he could have done. But he wanted to do it in such a way that they will recognize him and see him in a way that they have never seen him before. They have been with him, the disciples. And this account is talking about Peter and the, uh, the disciples in the boat and they, they were out late at night. They have been with him and they have seen things. But they have not seen him in this context. Jesus is ordinarily extraordinary. He is with those, listen to me carefully, he is with those that he appears to. 
If you have never seen Jesus in your life, and we're not talking his face because no man can see his face and live. But if you have never seen him by the knowledge that you have of him and the experience in your life, and you cannot say you have seen Jesus work on your behalf, you have seen him move, you have seen him stop things, you have seen him start things, then you have to check your relationship with him. Because he never leaves. Are you with me, somebody? He said he will always, always, always be with you. I'm going somewhere with this. It continues in Matthew 14, 26, and it says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Shift from sinking thinking. When you are in your boat... And what is outside of the boat is threatening your very existence. It is threatening your life. The threat is so real. The thing that you do not want to do is release fear. And misinterpret who you see and coming to you. You see, if you don't shift from your sinking thinking, you will never be able to do, hallelujah, what Peter did later on. There must be a shift. If you are not looking for Jesus to show up in the midst of your situation, hallelujah, you may not recognize him when he arrives. They were in the midst of the storm. They are accustomed to seeing Jesus do miracles. They, I mean, they, I mean, these guys are there. They were with him. Some, some people have said, you know, I wish Jesus was here today. I don't think you would have treated him any differently than you're doing now. I, I really don't think so. No, how oh, you could say that. It's Jesus. He's still here. And what you doing? Sorry, not you all. This is for those listening online. Hey, online people. If you're not looking for Jesus to show up in the midst of your situation, you may not recognize him when he arrives. Shout, he's alive. He's alive. And he's with me. You see, if you know he's with you, when he manifests himself in a different context, you will still know it's God. Because he was with them. Hallelujah. But they didn't know he was with them. Because what they saw coming, they couldn't believe it was him in that context. Because they weren't looking for him. Got a shift from the sinking thinking. One of the most powerful components of a sinking thinking is fear. Once you begin to fear, you, every thought sinks. Every thought is brought low. Every thought is diminished. Everything that you put your hands to do begins to now dwindle downward because you have released such. Fear shouts at you, I don't know what is happening. It shouts at you, why? Why is this happening? It shouts at you, I don't know the outcome. And because you don't know what's happening, you don't know why it's happening, and you don't know the outcome, you refuse to trust God. Sinking, thinking, you gotta go. I have resolved that I did not know I was going to be born. And I didn't have a problem with it. I could not have objected to it, because I didn't know what was happening, I didn't know why it was happening, and I didn't know the outcome. And if we could treat the situations in our lives like that, because if we could trust God to have us here in existence on the earth, then we need to trust God to take us through to the finish. So I've resolved, I did not know what was happening, I really did not know why, and I still don't know the outcome. Because I was born, but he didn't stop there. I started to grow. While I was growing, I didn't know when I was five how I was going to be at 10. While I was 10, I didn't know how I was going to be at 30. When I was 30, I did not know how I was going to be at 50. When I was 50, I did not know how I was going to be at 52. 
what I'm going to do, trust him. And release faith. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But we think when we go to bed tonight, all the plans that we have for tomorrow, God must keep us alive so that we could get those things done. We trust him for that. And we don't trust him. When we can understand what's happening, we don't know why it's happening, and we don't know what the outcome is. That's because of our sinking thinking. Fear produces worry, and worry gives worship to who? The devil. The word of God says worry not. Are you with me? Instead of fighting every act of restriction, you forget every active response, every accurate response. Let me say this again. Instead of fighting every active restriction, it should be up there for you shortly, you forget every accurate response. You have to sink with his resurrection. It's time to sink with his resurrection. There's a synchronization that is needed today in these last days. And just remember, I can't take my time with this, but I really want to break it down for you. I can't take my time with it because of time. But there's a synchronization that is absolutely necessary today with what we know about God, what we believe about God, and what we see concerning God. We have to synchronize this in order for us to make it to the next day. If you consider this entire account, you will realize the thought pattern was sinking. Isaiah 41 10 says, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will what? I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. But yet still, our sinking thinking produces fear. Psalms 20 Seven, I believe it is, 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That is us synchronizing with the word of the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord knows what he's doing. He knew it way back then and he still knows what he's doing. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We have to sync with the word Matthew chapter 14 verse 27 continues to say, But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. I'm going to start saying that. It is I. Do not be afraid. It is I. I mean, that is so complete. All he said is, it is I. He didn't ever use the I am at that time. He just said, it is I. That is complete. Nothing missing and nothing could be added. It is I. Verse 27 continues to say, but Jesus immediately, there was no hesitation, immediately spoke to them be of good courage is what he said. It is I. Do not be afraid. Whenever Jesus is your, wherever Jesus is, your courage is. It is. Can you real clap in? Pull on your mouth. You must see your face. All right. You're real enjoying this. Thank you. You might encourage the others. Wherever Jesus is, your joy is activated. Your joy is, but it's activated. Wherever Jesus is, your mind is renewed. There is no way he could appear and you could remain the same. The first thing he said to them, he said, hey, be of good cheer. Comfort yourself, man. I'm here. 
Rejoice, I'm here. Rise from that sinking thinking, I'm here. And because he lives, hallelujah, we could stand today in the midst of the storm and see that he who says it is I, it is. And he is. So we have to shift from sinking thinking and sink with his resurrection. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is what? Fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures evermore. Psalm 16, 11. You will what? Show me the path of life. That is sinking with his word. Sinking with his resurrection. He could only show us the path of life because he is alive. I said he is alive. Y'all need to learn to rejoice at the fact that he's alive. There's one thing he died. And we thank God that he went through all the suffering and he died. But had he stayed dead, we would not have had salvation or the opportunity, hallelujah, to be saved today. So I thank God today he's alive. Tomorrow he's alive. The next day he's alive. And my yesterday he was alive. He's alive because he's alive. Blessed be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Who comforts all. He comforts, comforts us in all, not some, in all our tribulation. So you could tell me you're going through something. And we all go through. I'm, listen, my mindset is shifting so much so people are going to think I'm crazy eventually. Well, some already think that. And, and Well, what can I say? But I'm realizing we had this thing so backward, so flipped, so turned the other way, so wrong side. It says here, blessed be the God and, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Who comforts us in all tribulation. My point is, if we maintain sinking thinking, we will miss his comfort, hallelujah, in all situations, in all tribulation. We cannot stay in a sinking thinking mode. We need to sink with his resurrection, hallelujah. We need to sink with it. Second, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. So you can read that. And in Matthew 14, 28, it continues in Matthew 14. It says, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. You know what? I read this so many times. I preach on it so many times. And something stood out to me again this time. Jesus appeared. They were afraid. And all he said to them, hey, it is I. Be of good cheer. Come on, cheer up, folks. It's all right. I'm here. He never said, I'm here for you to come to me. Sometimes we could put our foot in our mouth. But because of his grace and mercy, he allows some things to happen. Because I ain't seeing nothing here that says, I'm here for you guys to come out and walk like I'm walking underwater. Nothing was mentioned. Are you understanding this? But Peter, no. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you. Now, now watch this, watch this. Peter would have recognized the voice, you know. Because the first impression was a ghost. You ain't calling no might be ghost, Lord. Mm. So in the midst of the boisterous wind and all the waves and everything, he heard a familiar voice. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. But what I like about Peter, mm, let, let, just start rushing. Let me calm down. This thing is exciting to me, I just saying. Listen to me. Sometimes Jesus is not clearly visible in the midst of chaos because your eyes are on what he is doing and not who he is. And 
I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it. I've been so caught up in what he's doing. I miss who he was and who he is. Hallelujah. And who he said he will continue to be. Hallelujah. He's God of all. And he will comfort in all. Sometimes Jesus is not clearly visible in the midst of the chaos. Because your eyes are on what he's doing and not on who he is. I really want you to chew on that one. And we could still miss it. Whatever Jesus is doing at this point in your life is not all that he is. You know why? You know why Peter couldn't, couldn't recognize him and the disciples couldn't recognize him? Because they saw one aspect of Jesus. And they thought that was all Jesus. But you got to keep living this life daily. You got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling daily. You need to understand this is a daily walk. And we only have day and night because he said, let there be. Hallelujah. So he said this thing from the very beginning. So it could be for us to be in what he has called, let there be. Whatever Jesus is doing at this point in your life is not all that he is. Hear me, saints. The resurrection power has a lot more in it than what he has already done for you. His resurrection, hallelujah, can make more statements and more paragraphs and write many more books of your life if you could just see who he is and not only focus on what he has done and what he is doing. He wants you to know him. And his works will just be the perks. If you look at him, and not only his works, then you will see all that he is. And that should be enough for you to rise from your sinking thinking. Because it's sinking, if you'll know what I want to say. Sinking. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, 25 says... Let your eyes look straight ahead. And let your eyelids look right before you. So you, your eyes and your eyelids need to stay focused. Need to stay straight ahead. Listen to me. If you have to press toward the mark for the prize call of the high calling, the pressing means whatever it is is in front of you. You can't be pressing like this. He didn't say lean back. He said press. Looking on to Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross for you, for me, for us. And today, because he endured, he reigns. Today, because he endured, we can endure. And because he raised, we can reign with him. We will suffer a little while. We will suffer persecution. Hallelujah. But because he's alive, we reign with him. We shall sink with his resurrection. And shift from the sinking thinking. Continues to say, despising the shame. Despising the shame. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. My God. You got to learn to despise until you get to a position where you could sit. Despise until you could have a seat. Write it down. He didn't feel despised, nor did he despise others. He despised the shame. It's like whatever. You can imagine Jesus going, Psh. <laughs> whatever. Maybe not, but you know. 
Peter said, if it is you, hmm, we like, with a son, we just real question God, you know. We brave, but it's not only bravery. Sometimes we just lack it up here. And we lack it in here. And we just decide to allow our faith to sink. And it's okay to ask Jesus some questions. I heard, you know, some folks said, don't you dare question Jesus. I really have a few questions, I'm just saying. And I'm sure you have some too. But you have to be mindful. Don't feel, you know, you get too big now that you could just approach him and say, so what are you really doing right now in my life? Because I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Hey God, what are you doing? That's rude and disrespectful and you're going to be dealt with. Do you understand this? Because some of you, when you're angry, you're going before God. I was real mad with God. I tried that once and that was one of the most foolish things I've ever done. He sorted me out good and proper. I was all up in his face. God, why? And how are you going to allow this? And I had all the reasons until he showed me me and I was, that was it. I was quiet after that. Because we don't like to look at ourselves. You know, I said this before and the Spirit of God reminded me recently, anyone, including me, anyone who thinks so highly of themselves that they cannot remember where they used to be when they see others looking like how they used to be. You know when you reach a certain way? You, you got through all that you got through, whatever you went through, abuse, whatever you went through, you had... Um, but they call you were promiscuous. You you used to steal things. You, whatever lie. You were, you were a compulsive liar, and all of a sudden you got saved, and you're better now, and you're in a really good place. And and then you look at somebody, you lying to me. To hell with you. What? You committed fornication. To hell with you. Look at you. What did it? You stole that? And we quickly forget. Because pride steps in. But when I look at Jesus, oh my God. He took all of that. Yours and theirs. Mine and yours. He took all of that upon him. And he died. Before he died, he was crucified. He was gone. He went through so many things. He took all of that. And we still judge people without remembering what he did for us. Father, forgive us. And some of you know very well some things you shared with me. You should have only said it to God. But I've never judged you for it. Up to recently, someone was very, very truthful. I'm like, my God. Sometimes you, you wonder if you don't mind a lie. Because <laughs> the Holy Spirit told me to ask a person something. And I'm just praying and hoping and I guess wishing and wishing don't work. Hallelujah. That they would say, mm -mm. They were like, yes, apostle. <laughs> Jesus. At least I know for sure the Holy Spirit don't lie. But something, you know, so Peter asks, if it is you. Peter sensed his presence, but doubted because he never saw that aspect of Jesus. He did not see Jesus in that context. They were on land. Walking on land was the norm. Ain't nobody trying to walk on water. The creatures of the sea, they don't walk on water. They can shoot up like a dolphin above the water. Have you ever seen a dolphin walking on water? I haven't. What's that? They have flying fish. Have you ever seen a flying fish walk on water? Huh? So this was not, he couldn't recognize him. What am I saying to us today? If we have to sink with his resurrection, we have to understand that we need to expect him to show up in every aspect of our, of our lives, in every context, in Jesus' style. When it don't look like man, check to make sure it's God and not the devil. Once you realize it's not, the, do the elimination process. You check it out. Something is happening. Ta -da -da -da. You go. Not man. 
not devil. It has to be Jesus. He's alive. Peter couldn't do it. And then he said, if it is you, command me to come. You, you check him out good? I want you to see how we behave. If it is you, command me to come. All Jesus said is, hey, it is I. Fear not. You know, cheer, cheer up, cheer up. Be of good cheer. It is I. But Peter said, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come. <laughs> he said, command me to come. Listen to me. Peter was probably thinking I have never seen this, but I recognize the voice. So if I can recognize the voice, just before I draw near, I need to hear the voice again just to confirm what I know. And sometimes that's what we do. We play games. We know it. We boast that we know it. And then we say, wait, I need to confirm. If you know something, how come you need to go and know what you know? If you know it, you know it. Do you understand you cannot unknow something? I know they call this a rag. A pretty one. You could take this and fold it up in different ways and say to me, this is your iPad or your tablet. I would say, no. I know it's a rag. It just changed form, but it's a rag. How could you say you know who God is? It means we need to check what we really know about the God that we say we know. Because some people just boast. I'm hearing God's voice. I'm hearing God's voice. And then the same person will say to me, uh, let, let me just check God. Now, there are situations like with Abraham. Abraham was clear. He heard God's voice. Go, sacrifice Isaac. And he continued. And he heard God's voice again. But God said something to me. God said, Abraham never questioned me to get a second opinion. So I had to adjust some things. He continued. And when he was about to put the stake in Isaac... He heard God's voice. And he, he did not rebuke the devil because he heard God's voice before saying sacrifice Isaac. He heard God's voice and he knew it was God because he knew the voice of God. So God had to adjust some things in me. He said, don't you dare come to me for a second opinion. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of good we're still going to God for a second opinion. What about those who don't go to God? They consult man or they consult the devil. You do a, a free consultation that could cost you your life. Peter was probably saying, when I hear your voice directing me, uh, specifically to build my faith up, I can walk on the water. It's like we, we are saying, God, if I could hear your voice again, and I know it's you, and you bid me to come, and I make sure and I validate it's you, I'm going to walk on the water. Gideon did the same thing, you know, Gideon questioned God. But it was the same God, same voice he was hearing all the time. And I guess we all have to go through that process because of our levels of maturity. Not that I don't understand that, but I'm trying to get us to that place where we need to understand that when you know, you know. If you don't know, stop saying you know. And don't tell me a prophesy. Peter wanted to draw near to Jesus. Jesus style. He wanted to do it. And he, or he wanted to do what he saw Jesus was doing. Many of us want to be like Jesus. Eh? We want to be like Jesus. We want to do what Jesus did. Sometimes uh, you want to do 
like Jesus, but you just don't want to think like Jesus. You don't want to believe like Jesus. You don't want to live like Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen to me carefully. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Hallelujah. If you want to be like him, you want to do like him, you need to think like him because as he thought, he was, he is, and he is to come. So how are you thinking? Is your thinking sinking? I'm just thinking. And in Matthew chapter 14, verse 29, Jesus said, come. He didn't explain, fellas, I didn't come here for this to happen, you know. Or I didn't reveal it. But Peter had a kind of insight. He went into the inner inn. Remember we spoke about that? Peter knew the right question to ask. Because Jesus did not give him any kind of issues. He wasn't confronted. All Jesus said was, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, when Jesus said, come, you have to humble yourself. When Jesus says, come, you have to what? Humble yourselves. Peter come, came down from the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. He did it. He actually did it. But when Peter saw, in verse 30, but when Peter saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. All the time, watch this. The first thing was sight. Peter was afraid. <laughs> the thing that propelled Peter to make a move was a sound. The first thing that happened with his sight, he got blurred vision because they didn't know. They thought it was a ghost. When, when he heard God's voice, things started to clear up. When he confirmed it was the voice of Jesus, he, things started to clear up even further. So he was able to walk. So he did move. He walked on the water. Mm. I need you to be careful. Be careful of what is blurring your vision. And what is causing your thinking to sink. You have to be very careful because it was sight and sound that affected Peter the first time and it continued to affect Peter. You have to shift from your sinking thinking and sink with his resurrection. Listen to me. Fear knows it must surrender to Jesus. It knows that because fear is not of him. However, Jesus speaks to you, not to the fear. He wants you to ensure that you do not allow fear to abide and reign in your life. He wants you to deal with fear. He deals with you, you deal with fear. And you don't have much dealings with fear. You just release fear and fear has nothing to do with you. As a matter of fact, you don't have to offend fear. <laughs> you just stand in faith. And fear would say to you, that's not fear. It will leave. Listen, Peter was very sincere, but he was sincerely wrong about the process. You can be very sincere in what you're doing. I have seen very, very sincere people, but I put to you today, you have been sincerely wrong. I sincerely humbly apologize for speaking the truth in public. But it is what it is, it's the truth. You're sincerely wrong. Listen, perhaps Peter thought the call had something to do with the wind of the ocean. Because sometimes when God calls you and you're seeing other things happening, you're seeing people doing things, or he has placed other people around you, you think it might have something to do with them. But I'm looking at this thing again. God just, um, Jesus just said, come. 
And when Jesus calls, it's directly to himself. If he says, come, it's different than when he says, go there. Go, as he told Elijah, and ravens and stuff will have your meal prepared for you. You go ahead. You have a woman, she'll bake some stuff for you. Ravens, he said, go there. But this, he didn't say go anywhere. He said, come. When God, when Jesus said, come, when he says, come, he's calling you to himself. Get your attention in order. What God called Peter to do was greater than the vastness of the ocean and the boisterousness of the wind. But Peter started to pay attention to what he was able to see and what he was able to hear that was no longer the voice of God. However, like Peter, sometimes you tend to focus on things that presents itself outside of the voice of God. God's voice is not the wind. God's voice could only be his voice. And if you know him and you hear his voice, then you obey his voice and not what other thing is making a sound. When God releases and he speaks, there is a supernatural divine sound that is released and you will find contrary sounds, hallelujah, coming at you. But you need to understand, you have the capacity to focus on the voice of God. The voice of Jesus. You have to sync with his resurrection. Because he lives, you can hear his voice. Because he lives, no other sound could, uh, could drown the sound of the voice of God. Matthew chapter 14 verse 31 says, And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. Immediately. And said, you know, this, this, this struck me in another place when I saw this. It said a few things to me and I'll share it in a little while. And... He spoke. Now, 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 another element came in. It was sight. It was sound. And now it's touch. It's like Jesus was straightening up and aligning Peter's senses. And let me tell you something. You know why Jesus had to stretch his hand immediately? Because Peter was sinking. So it involved taste. I'm sure my brother drank some water. Because to cry out, <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> he had to be drinking something. He said, Oh, ye, ye of little faith, why did you doubt. Jesus, I, I'm trying to understand this. The man drowning. You stretch out your hand. Thank you, Lord. And then, not Peter, are you okay? Or Peter, say it again. Now. It is I. Be of good cheer. He didn't go that way. He dealt with the issue. He dealt with the issue inside Peter now. You see, the fear was external. And it got inside. And then for a minute, Peter broke free. And he started to walk. But then he started to listen to another sound, the sound of the wind. He took his eyes off Jesus. He messed with his sight, his vision. So Jesus now had to touch him. You know, I love God. You love God? I love God. You don't love God? What's wrong with you? I love him because I love him, I love him, I love him. Because I love him. Because I'm, I'm looking at him. When you mess up up here and you mess up in here, he still grabs you somewhere. He still reaches out. When you mess 
Jesus' voice and you can't recognize him. He said, I gotta get closer. And he grabs you. That's the power of the resurrection. Because he lives, we can feel him. And we can hear him. When we can see him, we just still know he's there. How many of you have experienced him on the inside of you? He just touches you on the inside. You don't really see what's going on. You can't hear too good, but you know. Oh, yeah, he's on the inside. We walk by faith and not by sight. And you got to just... You got to know that faith sees. But we don't walk by what we see. We walk by what we believe. But when we believe, we begin to see. You know, long ago we used to talk about blind faith. I, we need to stop all this. Ain't nothing blind about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. It doesn't mean the things are not existing. You just ain't in, not in a position to see it yet. Because God wants to work some things out on the inside of you. The resurrection power has to do some activation so that you could come out from that sinking position and rise, hallelujah, to the position that God has set you. Hallelujah, to be on this earth as good stewards. Hallelujah, as his representatives, as ambassadors. It's time to arise because he is alive. Jesus. Matthew 14, 32, it continues to say, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. I'm like, really? Really? Let me tell you something. Jesus, Jesus, the one who died, the one who was buried, the one who is alive, Jesus can do all things, including nothing. It's inclusive of nothing. Jesus was not concerned about the wind nor the ocean. He did not do anything about the storm until they got into the boat. Something in something right there. You see, in the midst of the storm, when Jesus gets a hold of you, hallelujah, there is no need to be concerned about the things that you were once afraid of because, hallelujah, he holds you and he is in control of the thing that was trying to get to you. He is alive and he is with you. He is alive and he is with me. He is alive and he is with us. Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, every other thing is rendered dead. He grabs you and everything else is taken care of. I was looking at that stuff, but Jesus, seriously, you could have, you're, you're Jesus. If he walked on the water, you could have dull that wind one time. Hey, Peter is drowned him. Chill out. He, he didn't even take that on. He waited until they got in the boat. Then, the wind ceased. So let me tell you something. We might not like this. But even while you're being saved, he will still allow the wind to blow. Even while you're being saved, he will still allow the sea to roar. You see, with Jesus, being saved means you're already saved. Once he gets a, gets a hold on you, it's finished. It's finished. The priority of Jesus has been and still is his image on the inside of us. He wasn't trying to save the wind. He was trying to save who he already was. Although uh, Peter didn't experience all that was to come. But this thing was already set on the inside. Because Peter had some kind of knowledge there that it had to be set from the before. For him to have it. He immediately responded to Peter's cry to be saved. Let me say it again. Because sometimes you think God is not there. He immediately responded to Peter's cry to be saved. If you ain't crying out, then you don't want to be saved. Because... 
as soon as he hears your cry, he responds immediately. My thing was, he wasn't just hearing Peter, he was seeing Peter. And he could have done it any other way. And I'm certain that he saw Peter before Peter cried out. As a matter of fact, I'm certain he knew that Peter was going to go down before Peter went down. And guess what? He allowed it. Put your hand on your chest like this. Say, Lord, you really allowed me to go through all of that? Listen for his voice now. Listen, listen. It's a resounding yes, ain't it? Say, come put your hand back here. Say, but Lord, you did like you did for Peter. You did it for me. You grabbed a hold of me. And you pulled me up. And you brought me out. And you set me in a safe place. Lord, today, I rejoice because you live, you reign. And you are my God. You see, we complain about him letting us go down. Because I, I, I said to him many times, I said, God, God, you knew this was going to happen. But I went through a failed relationship. I said, God, you knew it was going to He's like, yes, and your point? Do you know what else is going to happen? Well, he, he blew my mind. <laughs> so this is me now. This is me in my now. I'm like, God, what are you doing now? It hurts in a little bit. I feel in a little pain, but go ahead. It's okay to cry, right, God, because it really hurts it. He's like, go ahead, cry. But make sure your faith is built up. He said, I don't have the issues with the tears. But don't let your tears be more than your faith. Don't let your tears drown your faith. Don't let your tears put you in a sinking position. Hallelujah. You see, I know it's okay to cry because Jesus himself wept. You know what I found deep about that? That he was so much Jesus that he could dry my tears at so much man while being Jesus that he could weep too. So I'll be like, so who's going to dry his tears? Daddy, his father, our father. This thing is such a beautiful domino effect. Jesus did, did not just look at Peter, but he started to address Peter's sinking thinking. He said, oh, you have little faith. He didn't look at anything else. Do you understand what I'm saying? He looked at Peter's internal position. He was sinking, not because of the wind, not because of the water. Listen to me, and I'm going to say something, and some theologian might not agree with it. Not just because he took his eyes off of Jesus, or he stopped listening to his voice. It's because Peter started to believe what he was thinking. There, I said it. Once you start to believe what you're thinking, and you set your thoughts higher than God, his ways and thoughts are higher, but what, oh Jesus, thank you Holy Spirit, if you start to believe what you are thinking, then you automatically says to God, your ways and thoughts are not higher than mine. And boy, that's a sin. He said to Peter, you had enough faith to start walking out, but then your sinking thinking got in the way of your continuity. Some have started. Some have started. You're walking on the water, and all seems well, and you're walking proud, and all of a sudden, you're still moving your feet. But you're going down. This time you're moving your feet a little faster. Because you're trying to tread the water to stay up. You see, so there could still be movement while you're sinking. Mm. Because Peter was not still. But he was still sinking. So while you're doing all you're doing, you could be sinking and you don't even realize it. Because you begin to believe your own thoughts. 
And it becomes higher than God. And in your mind, because it can never really become higher than God's. But in your mind. Let me tell you something. In the midst of all of this, as, as you sink with the power of the resurrection, it activates the consistency of your internal operations. It activates it. You begin to not just start the process. You continue. I realize men, hearts are waxing cold, and that is the scripture. The word of God says it's going to happen. But men's hearts are waxing cold because of the lack of continuity. They just want to be where they are. That's their comfort zone. Too many people are complaining about how things change. If you know the word of God, you will rejoice because the, the end is near. The end is near. Don't give your attention to the wind and the ocean. They have their purpose. You focus on yours. Focus on yours. That's why I love eagles. Eagles here, eagles in my home, eagles in my office, eagles all over. Because I'm reminded every time I look at them, it might not mean much to you, but it means a lot to me because God told me what he has set on the inside of me. And he told me a lot of wind is going to blow, but just spread it. Spread it and rise. Spread it and rise. Let the, I realized the eagle acted a bit like Jesus. The eagle was not concerned about the wind. The eagle used the wind. I dare you to use what is trying to kill you right now. Don't pray for it to go away. Use it. Jesus never told Judas, go away. He never put him out. He never stopped the supper. He used Judas to fulfill purpose. And hug up your Judas, huh? So long and have a meal with your Judas. Smile with your Judas. Because your Judas has purpose. I'll tell your neighbor, say, your Judas has purpose. And say, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to call you Judas. Tell him one more time. Say, Judas. <laughs> John 11, 25 to 26 says, I'm going to put a pin in that. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And this is the big question it says in John eleven twenty six. 26. It says, do you believe this? Do you believe it? Matthew 5, 14. No, Matthew 14, verse 33 says, Then those who were in the boat came... And worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Listen, you are called for hire. You are called to walk on top. And that could only happen because he lives. So start stepping without struggling. Just wing it. Just flow. Just step. He said, come, you just keep walking. You're hearing another sound. You have what it takes uh, to ensure that you block it out and you keep walking. Shift from sinking thinking and sink with his resurrection. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. While we stand in our today, I'm closing. Luke chapter 24, verse 6 to 7 says, 24 six to seven it says he is not here he referring to Jesus he is not here but is risen remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man or sinful men 
and be crucified and the third day rise again. He is not where you think he is. If you are sinking, he is not down there with you. He is always in a position to get you where he has already positioned you. I think that was good. Faith, hope, and love exist because of his resurrection. Sink with his resurrection today, saints. Stewards, ambassadors, sink with his resurrection. Go through the word of God. Look at what it means, hallelujah, to us that he is resurrected, that he is alive. What does it mean? We cannot just be stuck at he died, he was buried, and he rose. That's not enough to, to, to keep us going. We are happy that he's alive. But why? What is the purpose of him being alive? How does it benefit us? And how does it bring him the glory when we function from the knowledge of the resurrection and its power? It is through the hope of resurrection. Or the Greek word is anastasis. That we experience God's gift of eternal life. The anastasis of God. It means, it's two parts. It means to stand, stasis, and up, ana. It means to what? Stand up. It is crucial regarding our salvation. That's a very crucial word, anastasis. It is very, very crucial. Because when you accepted him as Lord and Savior, there was no sinking in that process. There was an elevating. The anastasis of who you are the, in your being is to stand up. It's to rise up. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the crown of our faith and the hope of our future. Do you understand how very pertinent and powerful it is that he was resurrected. Sink with his resurrection. Sink with his resurrection. Tell your neighbors, a neighbor, you have to stand up. You have to look up. You have to wake up. You have to move up. You have to stay up. And you have to be up. You be unrestricted and permanent. No, you need to tell them that. Say, you be. Well, if they really want to, the washroom is there. But you be. Un what? Unrestricted and permanent. You got to be up. What do you mean? I, I'm unrestricted and it's a permanent position. Hallelujah, Anastasis. I shall stand up because he lives. I can wake up and stay up because he lives. I can be up. Say, neighbor. I'm unrestricted. I'm unrestricted. And it's permanent. Praise the Lord. I would have if I be always shout a little louder. Because you're up. Because he's up, you're up. Because of his resurrection, you can be born again. Are you with me? It's your divine function. You're born again because of his resurrection. Miss Yemajagadi, I gotta go quickly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God you will take the scripture down. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. You would see it inside there. You are empowered. Philippians chapter 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who what? Who strengthens me. I, uh, I got to pause a little bit and say something about that. Hmm. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Guess what? He is not doing it. Your dependency on his strength is what he says. Going to do it. You got to do it. So if you're sinking, you can do all things through Christ. Peter had a physical touch. 
we got a supernatural touch. So you got to know, you got to do something for yourselves. You can do how many things? All things, but through Christ. In other words, if you're sinking, you can't get up without him. Call him in. As soon as you cry out, immediately he responds. And he can only respond immediately because he lives. You can conquer the invasion of fear. Psalms 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. And whom shall I be? Of whom shall I be what? Afraid. You have victory over all. Romans 8.37. Just take it down quickly. You have faith. We could not have faith if he was still dead. Because of his resurrection. Now, every aspect of the process was absolutely necessary. How do you know um, it was necessary? Well, except you are God and you remain in that context, you cannot live if you did not die. It is set on earth. There must be death, burial, and for us, resurrection. For him, he was the first of resurrections. Are you with me? Are you with me? So, so, so the reality is, if he did not rise again, then we would not have been able to have faith. What would you have believed in? His death alone was not all that he was sent to do. Anyway, so that's the Romans, right? Okay, so you have everlasting life. We all have that because of him. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Sink with his resurrection. Sink with his resurrection. Give Jesus your past. Live in him and for him now and trust him with your future. Give him your past. Live in and for him now and trust him with your future. Because he lives, you can do that. Are you with me? And all we need to do is agree. Anchored in his absoluteness. That's our position. Genetically and supernaturally aligned. That's our position. That's the synchronization of his resurrection. Our responsibly reserved. Or responsibly respond, sorry. E, engage in his essentials. E, exist in his exactness. All we need to do, saints... Just put it back up for them. Uh, it's agree. It's agree. Stand with me at this point. Sink with his resurrection. Thank you.